Hello, uh, everyone who's here and everybody who will be here. Uh, my name is William Wyatt, and this is the uh, fifth and, uh, uh, semester meeting of the Disabled and Non-Disabled Alliance. Uh, this is the fun one because it's right next to Halloween and it's midterms and everything's, everything's hard for me personally. <laughs> so uh, welcome to it. And today's topic is cooking with disabilities. Uh, followed by after after uh, a presentation, which uh, I was not involved with, I'll confess right up front. Uh, so our, our uh, great, lovely officers uh, who did all the work, uh, Rian and Brian will be uh, presenting the bulk of, of everything of the information today. So I'm just introing us then. Um, yeah, afterwards, uh, once we've done that, once we've uh, done discussion and whatnot, uh, we're hoping to be able to play Among Us. I don't think we're going to bother to record that bit because, like, why? But uh, also, there may be a lot of a lot of swearing, um, <laughs> and so yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be it's a it's a casual kind of day, but there's actually a lot of potentially very useful information in here, depending on uh, the disability. From what I'm gathering, it's very broad based. So, without further ado, uh, let's do the the thing, the, the, the meat of the thing. Uh, announcements, I'll just run through this real quick. Um, the theater department uh, is putting on a, a production of Rocky Horror Show, uh, normally Rocky Horror Picture Show. In this case, there's no picture. Uh, it's, lit, it's a play, or rather a musical. Uh, and Sunday, Halloween day is the last day to see it. Uh, I've seen it personally. It's excellent. Uh, most, probably the most, I, I'm told it diverges a lot from the sort of uh, canon from the, uh, the the standard depiction, the, the actual film, Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, and in some in some interesting and and, and very uh, good ways. But more than that, it's very well performed, um, and I want to talk about it. So somebody somebody go and watch it. Okay, uh, next month is Native American Heritage Month. Uh, you can check the uh, E N I T. I actually do not know what that stands for. Oh, uh, it stands for. for um uh oh no i for, i had it and then i forgot it um oh ensuring native indian traditions it's a club oh. on campus anyone can join or check it out or follow them on their social medias they're a great group of people very friendly um very informative and uh i highly recommend checking them out and they've got a lot of events lined up for next month that are open to all. So if you check them out, then I highly recommend attending those events as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And if uh, anybody has any other announcements, um, feel free to to shout them out. Um, either either here or in chat. We'll we'll read anything in chat. Uh, but otherwise, and in and in the meantime. Uh, we want to say happy Halloween and or uh, Dia de los Muertos and or whatever, maybe nothing. It might be, it might just be a, a fun, uh, spooky Sunday for you. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> okay. I believe that's everything. Let me check the chat real quick. Yeah. Okay. In that case, without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to the people who actually did the work on this this project, um, all of it from start to finish, because I had stuff, I had other things. Rayon and Brian, please take it from here. All right, cooking with disabilities. We're going to start off by talking about food prep and meal planning. This sounds like one of those things that um, health gurus and fitness buffs uh, talk about a lot, but actually it is very useful, especially if you tend to run out of energy midweek, because when you do food prep and meal planning, you basically get all the prep work and little stuff done so that you don't have to deal with that later on, and you can just throw the ingredients together and boom, you have a meal. It can be something that you work together on with roommates or family, so you don't have to do all that chopping or sorting or organizing by yourself. Um, and on the screen, there is this link to a pre-made low spoons meal plan that includes recipes and a shopping list. 
this thing is incredibly helpful um, because it has done half the work of meal planning and food prep for you already because everything's already there. It has a plan for what meal and snack to have each day of the week and it's pretty diverse um, and they're all things that you can easily throw together with a minimal amount of kitchen utensils. The most you'll need is like a spoon and a fork <clears throat> and it also has a shopping list attached to it as well so you don't have to like write everything down that you need to shop for and it also has the estimated prices which is really great if you are trying to keep a low budget and then it has specific instructions for each recipe as well this is a great resource you can uh, make a copy of it and adapt it to your own needs uh, or you can use it as is or you can use it as an example of what meal planning can look like for you. It doesn't exactly have to be the same, but it gives you a good idea of what meal planning can look like. Um, and I personally found it pretty helpful. Brian put the link in the chat. Thank you so much. So how to do food prep and meal planning. This is something that I threw together myself based on my own experiences. It doesn't have to be exactly this way, but this is just an example of how you could do it so you can get things going. Make a list of things you often like to eat and sort by amount of energy it takes to make. This is great if you have same foods um, that you often eat because then you kind of have everything that you kind of need to fall back on when you need to eat on the same place on a piece of paper that you can look at and refer to when you're making your shopping list. Next, you write mm -hmm. down the ingredients for each dish and this will essentially be your shopping list at the beginning of the week. After that, when you have all your ingredients in front of you, you start cutting up everything that needs to be cut up and pre-make as much as you can throw it in a Tupperware and put it in the freezer or fridge, depending on how long you'll take to get around to it. And then that way you can just throw everything together easily later. And then after that, you write down what dishes you plan to make and attach them to the days and times as you see fit. So for example, if you need comfort food on Wednesdays usually and a quick pick me up, you can put your favorite meal on Wednesdays. This is just an example. You can do it totally differently. Um, but this is just a visualization of that process to help you get started. Okay. Lastly, when prepping ingredients for a meal, it's often important to make sure that you have everything measured and proportioned out as the recipe calls for. This is mainly so you don't need to pull out your stock of ingredients out over and over again, and the process of making the food will go smoother. A great example of this is cake baking. You don't want to have to pull out the flour or sugar bag repeatedly because it's so big and so annoying to put away and pull out again. So instead of just using it as you need it, you take it out, scoop out what you need ahead of time, put it aside, have everything laid out and then when you get to actually making the cake you just put the pre-measured ingredients in as you go and you're all good okay then we have the topic of mixing blending and cutting these are things that are often used in the kitchen for pretty much every recipe uh, food processors, blenders, and stand mixers are all incredibly useful if you have the space and money for them, but if you don't, that is okay. You can work at your own pace. There's no shame in going slow when you're cooking for yourself because you are cooking for yourself. There's no time limit other than, you know, how ravenous you are, but you can always try to plan ahead and make time for that. 
the pumpkin cake I recently made took me a whole week. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, with a, a normal person, you'd probably take like a day or two tops. Um, other things you can do to get around not having these tools is to try to pick recipes that minimize using those methods uh, or even buy things that are pre-cut. You know, there's no shame in buying things that are pre-cut if you have trouble cutting things. That's why they exist. It's okay to buy them. Um, and then another thing that I personally like to do is schedule cooking parties with my friends. I have a lot of fun inviting my friends over and cooking together and I can make them do all the heavy work <laughs> while, I, while I do the more manageable stuff. Okay. Some tips for cutting because it is a difficult thing for a lot of people and it's kind of essential. Um, if your disability is sight related, you can use your hands to guide the knife, keeping your fingers curled so that only your knuckles are exposed. You don't wanna get the tip of your finger and go slow if you're new at cutting. Um, the way you do it, you wanna keep your knuckles on the item and kind of just put the knife up against it and then you, you feel where it is and then you can move your hand out of the way a bit and then push down as you cut. That's how I would advise going about that. If your disability is strength related, like mine, you can see if you can put the cutting board on a lower surface, like the dining room table or the counter so that you can use your body weight to push the knife down. I've actually um, put cutting boards on my lap before and that works pretty well sometimes if I need that extra body weight to push the knife down. Otherwise, if you don't have access to a lower surface that works for you, you can use a serrated knife and patiently work at sawing it. It will, it will take a while, but you'll get there. If the disability involves knife phobias, which is a common thing and very understandable, see if you can snap or tear it apart with a fork or your hands, like um, green beans. I usually snap green beans because it's much more convenient and I don't have to grip the knife or the green beans as I cut at it. It's a lot easier for me personally. <laughs> and those are just examples. If you find something that works for you that is a list of here, that is amazing. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just ways that you can go about doing things that you might not have thought of before. Okay. So frozen food, there is a stigma against frozen food, especially by health nuts, because they say, oh, it's not good for you. It doesn't have the proper nutrients. It's not as good as a home cooked meal. It is food. It is food. If you need to rely on frozen food, rely on frozen food. There is no shame in that. And even if you don't need to rely on frozen food, frozen food tastes good. Okay. Half my Half my meals are frozen foods. They're so easy to put together and you can even customize them if you're worried about like the nutrients in it. Um, but, you know, have no shame at all in frozen foods. Frozen foods are your friends and so is the microwave. <laughs> well, some example of how you can make a meal more healthy with frozen food Target sells bags of free chopped frozen pre free chopped pre chopped frozen broccoli, and the marketplace at Sac State often carries bags of frozen peas and or carrots. You can very easily add that to your meal, or cook it in the microwave in a little bowl and have that be like a side dish or something. And luckily, gluten free and dairy free food options are also becoming more and more common. So if you have those dietary needs, it's worth looking into frozen food options if you also struggle with preparing meals. For example, the um, dairy-free brand Daya has a gluten-free and dairy-free frozen pizza. It's pretty good. I personally like it. 
Uh, it might not be to your taste because everyone has preferences, but that's just an example of the options available out there and they're not the only ones. And as long as you has a, have a decent variety of food and you're getting enough of each food group that your body needs, you are good. No food is ever the enemy. Everyone needs to eat, okay? Okay, uh, this is my slide. Uh, I guess like like one of the positives for like frozen food is that there's so many varieties and I will never become boring. Um, like personally for me, I like getting a lot of frozen food in the Asian section. Uh, there's always going to be dumplings, uh, and also there's restaurant quality ramen. Uh, and like and on the right, that's that's a frozen ramen, and it looks like restaurant quality kind of. <laughs> and and you have to check out like Asian grocery stores because that's where like that's where like the good frozen food is at. Maybe like in American stores, not not so much, but like for Costco, they do serve really good Asian food, Asian uh, frozen food. But um, I guess like local like Asian grocery stores in Sacramento is Ranch Ninety Nine, uh, um, SF. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, and those like kind of grocery stores are like better, and usually like they're like better quality, kind of. And I guess like other like varieties is like pre-made mac and cheese bowls with broccoli mixed in. Uh, and it's, it's pretty good. It's like really cheesy, really, um, yeah, really cheesy. And I guess that's good. And there's also chicken pita sandwiches. Uh, this is breaded chicken and cheddar with pita bread. And that's really good. And like breakfast burritos is really good too. Like in the morning, uh, you don't have time, you may not have time to get like, I guess like a meal ready. You could just pop in the microwave and then it's done. And it is still pretty good. I have some tips for freezing. If you want to freeze food that you have pre-made and use for later, you can use ice cube trays, preferably something flexible like silicon. Um, for example, you can caramelize your onions, put it into an ice tray with maybe a bit of melted butter. And then when you freeze it, they'll become solid and you can just pop out as many onion cubes as you need for the dish. It can be a very easy way to add some flavor or vegetables to your dish. You can also throw your cubed flavors and vegetables into the pan before or early on in the cooking, or you can melt it in the microwave and just dump it in the food, mix it up, and you're good. If the food that you want to freeze is bigger, you would put it into a Tupperware or a Ziploc bag with the air pushed out and then put it into the freezer. When you need to defrost, you can put it onto a plate or bowl so the plastic doesn't melt. Again, the microwave is your best friend. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna talk about using the stove. Um, this kind of has its own category because it's a big part of cooking. And it's one that can present a lot of obstacles to different people. And honestly, my advice is to just play around with it. Um, obviously, you know, don't play with the fire itself, but play around with um, positioning yourself with it and figuring out how to navigate around the stove. And pick the method that works most comfortably for you. Some examples would be standing with or without a chair nearby so you can rest in between cooking stages like if the water needs to boil but you need to keep an eye on it you can bring over a stool and sit down and save your energy while you wait you could sit on a chair that has enough height we can see this example in the video brian posted earlier today with the josie and the tiger and the fish anime where she uses this large step stool thing in front of the sink and stove to use the stove. You can use the stove from your wheelchair by parking parallel to the stove. That's what I do usually if I don't have enough energy to make my chair stand. Or you can use a small portable stove. Those are actually becoming more common. They're just these one or two stove um, plug-in things that you can put on the counter or the table and most pots and pans fit very easily on it. And then you can just use that and use it wherever you're most comfortable. If you have limited vision or are blind, 
um, some things that I've seen from other blind people is to use your sense of smell and testing the texture and hardness of the food carefully with a utensil to see what it's done. Uh, taste testing is always a good option. Just make sure you turn off the stove first so that you don't overcook the meal while you're testing it. Um, a lot of foods get very aromatic when they're cooking. So that's why I recommend using your sense of smell because, um, you know, when you when your mom is like cooking uh, a bunch of vegetables in a pan and you can smell from across the house, that's when you know it's ready. Part two, uh, telling the temperature on an electric stove. I wanted to talk about this specifically because they are very different from gas stoves. Um, please, please be careful when touching these. Um, the surface is smooth on a lot of modern electric stoves and you can very easily burn your hand if you put it on there without noticing it's on. It usually has some sort of light indicator to show that it's on, but that's the thing. There's no 3D aspect to it other than emitting heat. Um, and there's no sound either. Gas stoves, you can hear the click and the whoosh to tell you that it's on. But with the electric stove, it's very quiet. It doesn't have that same sound. Where the knobs are on the electric stoves depend on a model. I would check it out first before turning anything on. Some have buttons instead of knobs that are flat, so you can't really feel anything. Um, if you are buying a stove and you rely on touch to um, interpret the world around you, I would work with an employee in person at a store when buying your stove because this is a very important aspect of that. Um, like I said earlier, they're quieter than gas stoves. They will show the temperature on or around the knobs, but if you can't see or tell how hot the stove is um, regardless, then you can check how hot the pan is. The way you do this is you put the pan on, you turn the stove on, and after a minute or so of heating, take a drop of water or oil, small drop, especially if it's very hot, um, depending on what you're cooking, and then watch or listen for how quickly it sizzles, if at all. If it doesn't sizzle, it's not nearly hot enough, if it sizzles a lot, it is very hot um, and you might want to turn it down depending on what you're cooking. If it sizzles a bit and it's kind of a gradual sizzle, it's probably just right. So now we're going to talk about the oven. And this might be a no-brainer, but I have to say it, always use oven mitts, always. The risk of burning your hands is not worth it. Um, even if it's just opening the oven door. Some of these oven doors can get really hot and it's honestly a safety hazard. I don't know why they're built that way, but they are. Um, if the oven insides are too hard to reach by just bending down, uh, you can use a long stick or a grabber, preferably metal, to pull out the grate so that you can lower what you're baking onto it more safely. So you'll pull out the grate bend down from wherever you are and lower it down. Um, and you can also use the counter to lay yourself down carefully and keep your hand there so that you can pull yourself back up. Um, although I will say this only works with batches you can hold one hand, like a tray of cookies. I would not recommend it for like uh, Thanksgiving turkey, right? I wouldn't recommend that. Um, some ovens can be installed at higher places, so you don't have to bend down. They also often have French doors that open as two doors out the sides rather than one door downwards. My friend Emma's mom has an oven that's high up and has French doors. It's really handy for her because she has a hard time bending down. So now when she needs to cook baked meals or cakes, she can just take whatever's on the counter and just move it over into the oven without bending down. So 
I kind of breezed through that. Um, and now it's discussion time. So if you have any thoughts, anything at all, um, it doesn't even have to be disability related. It can be like your own personal experience with cooking or how it relates to your culture. Um, tips that you found helpful, what's your favorite thing to make, stuff like that. There are some more optional prompts on the next slide. How do you go about cooking? What is your favorite thing to cook? What would make cooking easier for you? And do you, do you use food delivery apps? I will mute myself now so that others can talk. Okay. Thank you, Rian. Um, I actually did have one thing I wanted to sort of supply and I, I, I think it's uh, in the in the realm of food preparation. Um, the way I went about it was with the, a mind not so much towards um, saving energy as saving time, but it's a similar sort of idea. Um, and, and, and the concept goes uh, combining stuff that can be cooked all at the same time in the same sort of container. So you don't need more than one container uh, uh, reaching you know, into the into the fridge and, and, and taking it out again. And the way I basically, and, and what I mean by that is I, I uh, cooked a bunch of like refried beans and vegetables and a uh, veggie patty and put it all in one, actually two oh, Tupperwares because there was that much stuff. Was uh, Maria, I don't know if you're- I am so sorry. No, I bumped my phone. I, my apologies. Okay. Oh, it's okay. You're good. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's that's um, that was that's kind of the the the, the cliff notes version of how I upped my burrito game. Uh, which is it's it just by taking the big pot, putting everything in that one pot, heating it up, um, and then uh, putting that in Tupperware containers for for the microwave later. Uh, yeah. Yeah, honestly, uh, um, I don't really cook that often. And, and like when I do, um, I usually just cook like Japanese food and like something chicken and parmesan. That seems pretty good. But I usually don't cook. Uh, my mom usually like does most of the cooking. And it's like, and, and since I'm Asian, it's it's gonna be Asian food. And it's like, and like there's always rice with it, I guess. And I guess for like food delivery apps, I use it all the time because I want to try like different cuisines. Like maybe like I want to try some eggs Benedict, um, some Indian food. Things like that. So um, I'd like to share, because when you're talking about frozen food, um, frozen vegetables are actually more nutritious uh, than canned vegetables. So they retain a lot of their uh, vitamins and nutrients once they're frozen. And then um, what you said about the burritos, you can, I don't know if you knew this, but you can put them together and then pop them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the freezer and then take them out, put them in the microwave or in the oven, whatever you want. So if you make like too much burrito filling, just heat up extra tortillas, roll them and then toss them in the freezer. And then if you wanted, you could even put like enchilada sauce on top and make enchiladas one night. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and, and that's a good thing about the canned uh, food versus frozen food too because oh my god even with a can opener they are so hard to open they're so hard I, I literally can't open any cans it's horrible um and the edges are so sharp too that's like a, a huge um injury concern there because if you grab it wrong it's like you cut your fingers um but yeah Frozen foods are, are my hero. They're my hero. <laughs> they do dull quick. Yeah, it can it can get dangerous. Um, yeah, it's 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 a huge pain. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, a great tip about the burrito filling. I I didn't um, connect the dots between burrito fillings and enchiladas. So I'm gonna have to try that one time making an enchilada. I like enchiladas.
I think my favorite thing to cook is probably mm. um, anything that uses a pan. They're a lot easier to use than pots because um, pots are very tall. I like using pans on the stove, um, especially things like crepes and fried eggs and grilled sandwiches, stuff like that, and quesadillas. I can't tell, but am I audible at the moment? You are. Okay, cool. Uh, my Zoom is going funny as, as it always does seemingly when I record. Uh, yeah. Just making, sorry, just making sure I, I don't actually have anything else to say or contribute. Okay. Uh, I wonder, we haven't talked about uh, dishes and whatnot. Dishes? Yeah, but the only, I don't know, I, I don't have much to say about dishes, but like the only thing I'd recommend um, if anybody, in case anybody doesn't usually do it, uh, is to like, you know, pre-soak everything such that it's easier to scrub away whatever's on there. Uh, oh, yeah. Later on. I, it, I it, it involves kind of monopolizing that. the sink, which I'm sure my roommates don't appreciate, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really should have thought about that because... Um, Washing the dishes and keeping your stuff clean is a huge part of cooking. I didn't think of that, about that for some reason. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Okay. Yeah. Have a good weekend, Maria. She's not here anymore, but yeah. <laughs> have a good weekend via the recording. <laughs> um, yeah, washing dishes. I, I can wash dishes by hand um if the sink has space underneath it but I cannot use the dishwasher oddly enough because the door opens downwards and I can't reach anything because of that <laughs> that's fun when they they make an appliance to make things easier and then fail to design it universally <laughs> <laughs> yeah if it opens sideways that would work yeah. Furthermore, like, is there a logistical reason why they couldn't? I mean, I understand, like, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't just want to take a standard dishwasher and put a sideways opening door on it because uh, yeah. the, the bottom tray usually works. But it's, it strikes me as eminently possible to, like, make one that works. Yeah. As long as it has a good seal, I don't see why not. Maybe you'd have to put the soap in a different area. Because I, I think you put the soap on the inside of the door at the bottom, right? Uh, know. Depends. Like, but... <laughs> <laughs> I've touched a dishwasher five times in my life and all of them were 10 years ago or more. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> there's a bunch of oh I, you know what I forgot I forgot to include a section on um, the special cooking tools there are um, cutting bowls that have like grates on the bottom of them so that you can just have your knife go through those when you're chopping things instead of having no, to hold it and there's also uh, salad bowl things where it's, it's like a bowl with a spinner, uh, another bowl on the inside attached to the spinner. And when you put the lid on and push the button on top, it spins it around and mixes it for you. Um, I think my mom has one of those. Um, oh, there are food processors. There's the handheld ones and the... Um, uh, the standalone ones with the little tube at the top that you pour things into. There's a lot of stuff out there, so if you have trouble with things, it's it's worth looking into because there might be something that could help. Yeah. Um, 
well, we only have three people left, so I'm afraid we cannot do Among Us. So let's just skip to the last slide. Thank you for coming. Our next meeting is November 12th at 7 p.m. And um, we will be posting our official schedule for the rest of the semester on our social medias. Finally, halfway through, I know it's okay. Um, so stay tuned and thank you so much for attending and for watching. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>